Hello there, hi, um, I'm Milo and welcome to the stream today. Uh, yeah, I think I said last time that I'd be doing rare ports, but no, I, I switched things around so today I'm doing rare uh, or pre-rare um, arcade games. Hello, Given, good to see you. Um, I'll, I'll stay on this screen of my main window for a little bit, uh, just checking that everything's working, because I want to give you the background up front before we play the games. So a lot of the uh, information about the games that I'm covering today um, or, or why I'm covering them comes from a thread on uh, the, oh gosh, what was it called? World of, dang it, I didn't write that down. Hold on, it's right here in my <laughs> notes spreadsheet. Uh, I think it's World of Sealand. <laughs> Open link. Yeah, wsland.podgamer.com. Wings over sea land. So this is a thread that started on some forums, but then the the writer, the um, who is known as the Reverend Stuart Campbell, turned, in, turned it into a really nice blog article um, doing this detective work because, okay, here's how it starts. Jetpack is a big success on the ZX Spectrum for Ultimate Play the Game, right? AKA, um, you know, Tim and uh, Chris and Tim Stamper and their collaborators. But at the time of its release, um, they made the claim that they were the most experienced arcade video game design team in Britain. So, what exactly did they make before Jetpack? Um, for a long time, we didn't really know, it was a bit secret. Uh, but thanks to uh, Stuart Campbell's um, detective work and hacking skills of people such as Mr. Cyan and ZX Aid on the Spectrum Computing Forums, we know which early games were worked on by the pre-Ultimate team. Um, so this team consisted of Chris Stamper, Tim Stamper, and John Lathbury. They were working for Associated Leisure, a kind of um, arcade and uh, other kind of... Uh, amusement-based company in the UK. But the director of that company, Norman Parker, left to form Zilek Electronics, or Zilek, uh, and the three of them went with him and joined the team. Uh, eventually, those three, plus Carol Ward, who is now Carol Stamper, um, having married... Oh, I don't remember which Stamper brother, sorry. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, so they eventually formed their own company out of Zilek and called it Ashby Computers and Graphics, uh, after the name of where they were based, Ashby de la Zouch in Leicestershire. Uh, Ashby Computers and Graphics, or ACG, as I'll probably call them most often on the stream, uh, do have a credit on the cover of Jetpack, on the, the cassette inlay for the Spectrum release of Jetpack, saying, ACG, trading ass, ultimate, play the game. And then from then on, ultimate became the de facto name of the company. But yeah, when people talk about Rare and their earliest days, they often start with Jetpack, um, ignoring the work of that team on earlier arcade games. So thanks to the thread, I've found seven games that I'll be covering today. Um, half of them are shooters, half of them are sort of maze game genre. If anybody knows about the early work of, of the Stampers, they often know about Dingo, which is uh, what I'll actually be ending with today because that's kind of their last work before, uh, before Jetpack and, and going onto the home computer market. But um, yeah, let's start with Vortex then. So this is a 1980 arcade game. I'll launch it up. Um, we don't have any flyers for it or cabinet art. What I've got on, on the stream layout is two of the next games I'll be playing. Okay, that looks good. Uh, I'll just make sure that the rest of my setup is all fine. <laughs> Yes, okay. Come on. Right. So yeah, on the left is Enigma 2. I'll be playing that next, and then Saturn is on the right. Um, but to start with Vortex, uh, I've seen online um, the name of the Associated Ledger company uh, uh, put next to this as well, whether that's... Um, 
yeah, so obviously there was still a bit of a relationship there, although the developer is noted as the Xylac, so they'd formed that team at this point. Um, as you can see from, well, actually what we'll do first is look at the dip switches. That's always fun to do with arcade games. Ah, it's all unknown. They're, they're there, but we don't know what they do. <laughs> um, and you can only change it to make it less fair, so requiring more money for a credit. So never mind, not for this one. So I'll insert my credit and we'll get started. So as you should be able to see, it's a pretty simple uh, Asteroids variant and the volume is actually quite loud. It's kind of just a hum, but the, it's kind of maxing out my OBS bar here, so I'll turn it down. Hope it sounds okay, let me know. So, and yeah, I've just died. It's it, it, These games are over very quickly because um, you only get one life. So there's also only one button. Sorry, what? Um, hmm, something, uh, I thought I wasn't having any problems with this controller anymore, but I think it's activating one of my hotkeys. Anyway, I think it's fine now. I'll just have to be careful with how I hold it. Anyway, um, yeah, it's it's basically an Asteroids variant. It's pretty simple. Um, you might find that with a few of the games I'm playing today. They're uh, noticeably based on other successful arcade games that, are, that were out at the time. And in 1980, not much was out. Um, this is pre... Donkey Kong pre-Space Invaders, I think, or around the time. Um, but yeah, we, we've only got one button. Um, it shoots, and if we hold it down, it does a little thrust forward. Took me a little while to figure that one out. Okay, there we go. That's what I wanted to last until at least, uh, getting the cameo from the Starship Enterprise coming in with the ZEC um, written on it, which I, I think is short for Xylec Electronics. Yeah, so that's one of the little um, Easter eggs that, that they insert um, to give credits to the company or whatever. Um, yeah, so register your initials with the Space Federation, another sort of Star Trek-y reference. Um, I was talking over the track mode before, so I just want to have a closer look at it this time. You can see the different things that you shoot, they're worth different points. Um, Oh, that's cool. <laughs> the letters sliding in. So yeah, they do put Xylite games up there on the title screen, so that's nice. Um, oh, and yes, so thanks to, like I said, the hacking into the code uh, in that article, which I will link in the YouTube upload. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's code within the ROM of the game that credits the developers by name. So it says, yeah, Chris Stamper and John Lathbury i put in there. Um, Tim Stamper, I guess, wasn't involved specifically on this one. Um, Chris was like the programmer and Tim was the graphics guy. Uh, maybe the graphics are a bit simple on this, so I, I don't know what's up with that, but that's who's credited. And yeah, let's have another crack. More credits, please. Yeah, so some of these games are quite simple. They might not take very long for me to play through them to my satisfaction. Um, but other ones might we might spend a little bit more time on. But yeah, this is one. This is essentially, as far as we know, the very earliest thing that the stamp has worked on. Ah, now see, that was pretty unfair. I respawned in the center of the screen, but there was a hazard already there, so I immediately died twice in a row. Um, yeah. Oops. Yeah, and you can only move in a straight line. At least with the setup I have, maybe it's a, a main input problem, but I can't change direction once I start thrusting. It could just be the simplicity of the game. Um, so the only sounds is like this background sort of rising scale tone. It speeds up, I guess. Uh, but then you get, well, you have the shot sound as well. But yeah, you've got the, the loud um, warbling noise when a sort of alien spacecraft enters the screen, whether it's a UFO like this one, little flying saucer, or the Enterprise makes a much louder sound at you. Yeah, just <laughs> the Enterprise shows up. Sure, why not? It's the 80s. Oh, actually, it's the 80s. It's pre-TNG, so it must be the Enterprise, um, you know, the NCC 1701. Nothing. Oops. Uh, yeah. 
Not even the not even the refit. The movies weren't out yet, I think. Oh, maybe they were. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, when was motion picture? Hmm. Had to have been around that time. Or were they all after TNG started production? I know there was some like sets and props in common between the TNG move, the TOS movies and the TNG show. Anyway. Whoop. Yeah. Can I at least pass one level today? <laughs> it's tough though. Um, I saw a YouTube video of someone playing this. There's not much footage of it online, but the one I saw, um, the player had like a whole bunch of lives. Oh no, <laughs> destroyed again by the Enterprise. Okay, we took out that last obstacle. So we're in level two and it looks pretty similar. Um, yeah, the, the player I was watching had a whole bunch of lives. I don't know how they did that, um, hacks or something. It's, it's not the dip switches. Uh, during testing, I flipped them all on and it didn't have any appreciable effect on gameplay that I could tell. Um, uh, yeah, maybe there's hacks and, or cheats in MAME, I don't really know. Anyway. Let's, oh, yeah, that's it. That's my run over. So this is the kind of games they had in the 80s, or in the very early 80s anyway, but they quickly became uh, more sophisticated. Um, so let's move on at that point. A uh, bit of backup for the, a uh, bit of setup for the next game. Um, I'm gonna be playing Enigma 2. This is also known as Phantoms 2. Uh, it's kind of a follow-up to an earlier uh, Xylec game, slightly earlier. So, to tell you about that, I need to tell you about SNK, the huge Japanese company that had their own thriving arcade business. Um, they're behind series like uh, King of Fighters and a bunch of other stuff I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> um, but they made a game called Ozma Wars, which is, uh, you know, a simple space shooter in the Space Invaders mold. Um, Xylec had a conversion of it, or they converted it themselves, I'm not sure which, and it was released in, or distributed in the UK under the name Space Phantoms, which hacked the, or it was a, a conversion of the game to change the space-based enemies into, like, demons and witches and things, and you were playing as an angel shooting at them, but it was the similar kind of space uh, ship shooting gameplay. So I guess Phantoms 2 is a sequel to Space Phantoms. Um, Enigma 2 is the same game, but uh, so Phantoms 2 is completely monochrome. And I don't know, from what I read, either Phantoms 2 was a hack of this or the other way around, I don't know. But as you can see, there's color here, but it's kind of limited. Um, so the, yeah, that's the difference between Phantoms 2, black and white, Enigma 2, uh, colored. And the flyer on the left, is from the Enigma 2, is advertising the Enigma 2 machine. Um, and the only sort of artwork you can see is just on the top banner of that machine. Uh, a nice little, sh you know, action shot of a spaceship. Um, and you might be able to just make out the company name at the bottom of that flyer, Game Plan. So that was a publisher or a distributor or whatever that Xylec had partnered with for Enigma 2. Um, yeah, and you can also see ZE on the tail fin of the ship up top, and then down below, I like electronics again, putting that credit in the game. As for other credits for individuals, within the code of the game, we've hacked out and we found the names John Lathbury again, Chris Stamper again, as well as Norman Parker, who is the director from um, Associated Leisure, who formed Zylec in the first place, as well as Dave Swift and Len Parks, whose names I haven't seen on any of the other stuff, so I don't know what's up with them, but apparently they helped out on this one. So, let's get started. We've seen all the intros and setup there, so let's have a go. So we have two buttons this time. Um, it's a very Space Invaders slash uh, Gallagher kind of setup here. Um, you can only have one shot on screen at a time, like in those games, but it won't stop you from shooting again, unlike those games. Like in Space Invaders, if you whiff a shot and miss all, all the enemies and it flies off the top of the screen, you're waiting ages before you can shoot again. Um, and that's kind of a, a penalty for you. But with this one, you can rapid fire. The only thing is, if you, if you do so, your last shot will disappear from the screen. 
Um, oh, and I've just figured out what the jet <laughs> propulsion button does. I was like, why would you ever need to use it to get closer to the enemies who are um, threatening you? Um, I suppose if you're a really high level player, you could get up and rapid fire some enemies to take them out quicker. Uh, but also they do drop those bombs that do a little bit of a, a sideways attack down there. So you can, if you're in a hurry to get out of the way of them, you could do a quick boost. Um, Stuart Campbell in his write up on all these games makes sure to note the connection between this boost move that the ship can do and the kind of main um, mechanic for the player character in Jetpack, which of course was the first Ultimate Spectrum game. Um, bit of a little boost up with a jet. So there you go. And as we can see, we can make it all the way to the top of the screen and won't do you much good though. <laughs> it's very hazardous. Um, yes, okay. Just checking my notes. Oh, the other interesting thing about uh, Phantoms 2 and Enigma 2 here. Oh, by the way, Phantoms 2, clearly it's a sequel to Phantoms, the way they had it. But Enigma 2, I think it's just a name. I don't think there was an Enigma 1. I've checked. Um, there are other games with similar names, which muddies it a bit, but I don't think... Um, I think it was just to make it seem more impressive or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um... In this time, uh, you had, you know, arcade games that ran on specific boards and companies could reuse the boards and write over them. So this game was designed to be written over a Space Invaders board. So it runs on a Space Invaders engine or, or you know, hardware or however you want to put it. Um, why did my bar fill up? I don't know what the bar down the bottom is. Oh, maybe that's my ammunition because that's going down the more I shoot. Or maybe it's the number of enemies. Yeah, it is my ammunition. If I rapid fire, it does fall. So there is even a, not a time limit, but a sort of resource limit on your runs here. If you don't manage to get, if you, if you have a really poor hit rate, or maybe it's harder in later levels, um, then that's a fail state for you. I guess it means that you can't just hang around on the machine forever. <laughs> Oops. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. So we have a new enemy here that becomes a smaller enemy when you defeat it and it drops a bomb at you. Oh! Oh, gosh. I wonder if I can turn this back with some dip switches because clearly we have more levels here with more varied um, yeah, enemy types and stuff on them. Oh, I've just noticed too that my ammunition bar stayed the same between levels. So, yikes. <laughs> it's a hard cap on your runs then, I suppose. Um, yeah, just get past this, please. Yeah, I don't need to record my initials. All right, let's fiddle with the dips. Oh, yes, lives, please. Skill level. Whoa, it goes all the way to six. Let's keep it at one, shall we? I think it's the way it works. Ah, oh, and you can change the number of enemies from 16 to 32. Okay. Good, so we'll do another run. Oh, and of course you can see the, the game plan name on the screen, the, the publisher of the game. Um, yeah, so I think it's interesting that uh, this is running on Space Invaders hardware, but I, I think it's a lot more fun than Space Invaders. It's more dynamic, um, fast paced. Uh, oops, gosh, which you know, that's fine, like, there can only be one Space Invaders and it starts everything, but then... Hey, I didn't get six lives, I only got three. Uh, I might have to reset the machine. Um, I'll just do that now. Reset, of course. That would be the case, yes. Okay, so... Doo -doo -doo. Yes, there we go, six lives. So I'll do try and do a more comprehensive run this time, maybe get a few more levels in. We didn't see half of the enemies on that, um, on that intro screen there. But yeah, we've also got angled shots coming from them sometimes as well as the downward shots and the bombs and the risk of physical collision with an alien. Um, but as you can see, as the enemies move between kind of layers of the screen, they change color. I think, I don't know if this was done in hardware and then, or, or whether the alternative, which MAME is then replicating, is that some games had 
monochrome graphics, but they had sort of strips of cellophane on them. So this is how some Game & Watch games had color graphics. Or uh, even Space Invaders itself had a re-release where they put cellophane on the screen to change the colors of the aliens on different rows or as they approach you. So it might have been that kind of scenario, I'm not sure. Uh, but either way, yeah, it's a little bit, you know, you could say it's primitive compared to what would come later in terms of how things are colored and... Oh gosh, the bomb even explodes next to you so you can't escape it by boosting up. That's, that's a nasty trick. Oh, I keep forgetting that's gonna happen. <laughs> Just gotta be really careful. And I don't want too many of the smaller ones on the screen at once. It just makes things more chaotic. Ah! Okay, cool. So yeah, I think this is pretty cool. Um, I was thinking about whether Ultimate and Rare really made any other shooters. Of course, Jetpack itself is a kind of shooter, but it's very non-traditional compared to things like this and like Gallagher and all that. Um, they, yeah, I don't think they really went much further. Oh, okay, this is a bonus round? I had a different jingle at the start. No, it's not a bonus round, it's just, it's still really hard. <laughs> um, okay, I don't know, should I have another run? What's the time? I think I'll have another run. Oops, Ugh, dang it. Don't know why it's doing that. I'll have to figure that out. Please accept my initials, people. Ugh, come on, yes, yes, dang it. All right. Ah, uh, yes, another, another credit, please. I wonder if it's the other way around, like turning it up to six might make it easier. I'll do a I'll do a challenge run after this. I'll have one more normal run. Uh. <gasps> oh, gotta thread that needle. Oh got me. Fair and square. But yeah, I was trying to think about like other rare games that are shooters. But if they ever go into shooting, it's not in this kind of style. Like I'm thinking Jet Force Gemini, that's kind of a shooter. Of course, Goldeneye and Perfect Dark. But yeah, not like this. The closest thing in more recent times would then be Jetpack Refueled. And you have things like Gunfright as well, which was uh, I talked about that during the uh, Monster Max episode. It was running on the Filmation 2 engine, 3D isometric, but no jumping. But uh, they sacrificed jumping to have scrolling, and then they have you explore a town and you're shooting banditos and stuff. I don't know. This, this stream was a lot of uh, work to prepare for, so I didn't think too much about that. But if you can think of any other rare shooters that would kind of follow this lineage. I guess as a part of the lineage of rare, taking an idea that's been done, but iterating on it themselves. Um, because this is iterating on Space Invaders. Oh, I could have boosted over that one. These look like little taxi cabs. But they're UFOs, trust me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, okay. They have weird movement patterns sometimes. Very fast. So there's some that just... Oh, I thought that was going to do the same thing and just loop and then go off screen. I just want to clear this one stage. Okay. Ammunition is running down. Yeah, there we go. Whoa. Oh, gosh. Did you... Yeah, so it either goes right or left. I don't know how to predict. <laughs> Maybe based on the position on screen. Nope, it just is random or alternating. I don't know. Almost there. Oh yeah, okay. 
Oh, it's getting risky. Yep. Oh, that was my chance. I blew it. Okay, one more. They're, they're sort of invincible when they're in those shields, I guess. Circular shields. Alright, so these stars are stopping my shots. There's a big UFO and a different jingle again that I talked over. Um, just got to thread the needle and avoid the shots. This is not too difficult, actually. As long as you stay ahead of the shots of the UFO. <sighs> that was close. This is my last life, too, so... <laughs> have to be careful but it all ends here either I take this final mothership down oh boy oh the bomb shot oh, the bomb shot at me that's so unfair <laughs> well I was just saying how easy it was okay so there ends my run of Enigma 2 from 1981 so let's move on to the final shooter of today yeah I think I think the timing is working out pretty well um Hopefully, yeah, because some of the later ones might take longer, but there's also ports to look at. Uh, not all of these got ports, but the ones that did might be interesting to check out. Okay, so I'll just change the window over again. This doesn't, this sort of opens a new window each time that I have to swap to, so just give me a couple of seconds. Okay, that looks good. So yeah, 1983, it's got their Zelic Electronics, and by now they've made a, a partnership with Jaleco, the Japanese uh, publisher. So that's cool. We've played some Jaleco games on stream before, most notably recently City Connection, the kind of car platformer about Clarice traveling the world and painting the streets. Um, I don't remember off the hand what else they made, but they're a big name in, um, in video games, especially at this time. So... Uh, already you should be able to see how Saturn is iterating on Enigma 2 with this kind of scrolling spaceship going past with the name written on it. We saw Xylek briefly there as well as there's the name of the game, Saturn. Um, but obviously things are a lot more colorful now, a lot more detailed. This is two years uh, afterwards, 1983. Um, and as for the credits in the code for this one, we see the names uh, John Lathbury again. Chris Stamper and Tim Stamper, as well as mentions of the company's Exodus. And that's like Exodus, but with an I instead of a U, and AW Electronics. I'm not really sure uh, the interrelation of these companies, but AW Electronics is credited on some of the other um, arcade games in external sources. Sorry, I'm just turning the volume up because I think it was a bit low for that last one. Uh, it's hard to tell what the balance is because these sounds aren't the usual sounds that I get out of games. So, yeah. Anyway, let me know if it sounds okay. Um, yeah, so I don't know what AW Electronics is, but it's involved with these these names and um, Ashby and Zylac. Uh, whether it's a shell company, a sub, subs, a subsidiary or something, I don't know. But I, I do know that actually when Lathbury and the Stampers joined uh, Zylac, they all became part of the board of directors so it was a small company um but they were on board there in leadership from the start um as well as you know making the game so it's a very small company i guess anyway um not leadership but more like a stakeholder i don't know business i don't know how it works right all right let's go oh uh dip switches now i'll do a normal run first then i'll see how i can change it up so credits two ships and two buttons again, but instead of a thrust button, what we have is two different kinds of shots. Now this is, I was talking about how fast paced and, and frantic uh, Enigma 2 could be, but this is even dialing it up further. This is, this is requiring a lot of concentration and yeah, very chaotic. Um, but yeah, we do have those two shot types. You can only, okay. And once you take a hit, there's a brief pause before you explode, very dramatic. Um, but yeah, the big planet in the background is very cool, although the color of it kind of masks some of the enemy ships at times, which could even be intentional to make it a little bit more, um, yeah, frantic. Uh, yeah. Oh, let's test your Roman numerals here. MCM1900... Five three eighty three. Yes, I told you it was nineteen eighty three, but 
it's kind of a faux cinematic thing to put it in there. And Roman numerals. Oh, the planet's a different color. What? <laughs> it's more blue now. I guess, I don't know, maybe it's a main palette issue, but um, as you progress through the levels, and my goal here is to get to level three because Stuart Campbell noted that uh, the gameplay changes up at that point. Uh, but yeah, you do have different planets in the background. And this is a kind of connective tissue to another... Oh gosh, really? All right, let's hit up those dip switches. And that's actually really interesting how the ships kind of... Um, oh, what's this? Uh, all right, well, I'll... <laughs> that was weird. I'll talk about that, I'll talk about... Um, so we'll bu pump up our lives. Coins are fine. That's all we have, so that's good. We'll get a bit further with more lives. Um, yeah, I was going to say, it's interesting how the ships... Oh, it's a different planet again, so it's just random, I guess, each time. Oh, oh dang it. Yeah, the ships kind of have this effect, you know, they, they turn in space and then turn around and then they kind of zoom towards you even um, where the sprite gets bigger on screen. Oh, I forgot to reset. That, that's The dip switches won't take effect unless you reset. Yeah, so interesting sprite scaling effects. Not sprite scaling, but do, swapping out sprites to give the illusion of um, sort of 3D uh, depth of interaction. Sort of. I don't know. Um, wow, brightly colored. So I guess you should always be pushing both buttons. Oh, hang on. That's something I can do. Hold down both and then move. And yeah, there's the bonus ship again. Okay, I'll just hold them both down. And then that lets me move as well. I was having trouble with uh, inputs registering when I'm doing them at the same time before, but I think I've figured it out now. <laughs> Given calling out the coloration there being very garish. Oh. Okay, you can hold down the primary fire, but you have to press the secondary fire each time. But you can only have one of those on screen at a time. So I've seen comparisons of this to Galaga, but... Oh, was it this one or another one that runs on a Galaxian board? So Galaxian is the sequel to... Did I just oh, die when I was looking at my notes? Dang it. Anyway, um, Galax Galaxian was a sequel to Galaga. Um, <laughs> I find it funny that it seems like you're kind of blowing up a civilian ship there, but you get a bonus for it. And it's got the company name on it too. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so hold down primary fire and tap secondary fire to get more shots up. How do I pass a level? <laughs> Um, I'll try and figure it out. Anyway, I was going to talk about the other connection. So there's the planets in the background. Um, on lists of uh, Ashby games, Ashby computers and graphics, who, you know, I guess Xylec is the predecessor company to Ashby computer and graphics. Uh, again, I'm not sure of the exact relation between them, but... Um, they had the same people at them, so it's sort of a continuum in terms of development in some ways. Um, but yeah, while doing this research, Stuart Campbell found different lists online um, and old articles in old um, like home computer magazines, like Commodore 64 magazine, that kind of thing, Spectrum magazines. There were a lot of those at the time. Um, and yeah, they... I guess even then they didn't... What the... Someone just came past on a space jet ski and leaned over. A kind of funny looking Muppety alien. Anyway. Um... Oh, what hit me? Nuts. Uh... Oh gosh. It's really tight, the timing on some of this. Anyway. Um... Oh, I didn't actually show off the other mechanic. You can move! Oh, stop! I probably should make some save states if I want to make actual progress, but I haven't, I haven't set that up. I haven't figured it out. Anyway, um... Oh, what? No! Oh, that messed me up. Um, dang. 
Oh well, I'll keep trying. <laughs> My goal is still to get to level three. Uh, extra credits do nothing to help me. <sighs> so soon. Anyway, um, the planets in the background. So there's lists of games that um, the Stampers or Ashby did, and they're not all accurate. Um, so one of these old magazine articles uh, credited to their name the game Gyrus, which is a similar kind of space shooter to this, but other sources say, you know, it was made internally at Konami, all the people who made it were Japanese names, so yeah, that, that ended up being a red herring um, that Gyrus was one of theirs, but if you compare, compare it to this, um, there are some similarities. It has the, the planets in the background, um, and of course the setup is similar, but that was common to a lot of games at this time because everyone was trying to make the next Galaga. Galaga was huge. Ugh, I, I don't know why that's happening. What are you doing? There's got to be... This isn't just continuous, right? I think I was down to the last enemy spaceship a little while back, so I'll just keep trying. Using the secondary shot kind of messes me up because it also stops... Again, I don't know if this is an input thing, but it stops me from being able to move if I'm not pressing the right buttons. It, it's hard to explain, but it's just a little tricky. So like if I'm holding the fire button, I can't move, but if I press the secondary fire button, then I can move. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if that's intentional. I'm guessing not, but anyway. Let's try and get to level three. Let's do it. Even though I've lost a, a life already so soon. But yeah, I'm, I'm just really admiring the way these ships fly around. You see them then get bigger. Oh God, that's really irritating me. <sighs> okay, okay, we're all good. It's fine. Oh yeah, that's a good call actually, Gibbon. Oops, asteroid style. Hit those rocks, they break up into smaller ones. Did not expect that. Oh, come on. Um, yeah, Gibbon said, reminds me of some of the Daigyakushu backgrounds, referring to Donkey Kong 3 Daigyakushu, or the Great Revenge, or whatever. Um, the Sharp X1 and Hudson PC-98 uh, uh, game by Hudson as part of their, uh, <laughs> their line of Nintendo sequels they did a Super Mario Brothers special, a Mario Brothers special. Um, did they do Punch Ball as well? Yeah, Punch Ball Mario Brothers. What else did they do? That might have been it. But yeah, great stuff. Oh, you serious? It reflected my special shot back at me. Okay. I'm just not going to use that special shot at all. It's messing me up too much. But I did manage to get to stage two, so that's progress. I'll keep trying until I get to stage three. That's my goal. Okay. Yeah, there is a weird thing with the, the movement here. It's easiest for me if I just hold both buttons down, then I can move freely and I don't get the second shot, but I, I can at least keep normal shot up and move. So, oh, are you serious? <laughs> this game is just so fast. It's difficult to react to. Oh, nuts. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the other advancements I guess they had was that they're able to have music happening during gameplay, which hasn't been the case with these other shooters that I've been playing today up till now. They only had sort of jingles. They even are able to vary the music when a bonus ship comes on screen or things like that. So that's cool showing the advancement of the medium and how far it's come in only three years, you know? It's pretty cool. And the stampers were there at the forefront of it. Maybe not the forefront, slightly behind. <laughs> OK, 
considering everyone at this point is just ripping off Galagar. Um, and Galagar, of course, is ripping off Space Invaders, clearly. I wonder what Space Invaders was ripping off. What was that, um, like, Missile Command or something? Something like that, maybe. I don't know. I'll keep trying. Stage three, it's going to be worth it, I, I hope. Oh, it's just so tricky. Maybe I will try that save state thing. Uh, okay, so that's how I've set it up. And I can do that. Okay, so if I'm doing well and I have a, a number of lives, but I've lost one, so then I can just go straight back. Okay, so I'll do that. Thank you, past me, for setting up save states in main. Ah, um, I'll keep going. Only three lives though. <laughs> no, all right, I'll go back. <laughs> Just gotta remember to save if I'm actually doing well. Yep. <laughs> totally cheesing it now, but yeah, the shooters are kind of the the sideshow. The main thing is the is the maze games because they have a bit more character to them and they lead more directly into some of the ultimate stuff and especially Dingo which is the one that people have heard of. It's not to say that these aren't good games though. Okay. Oof. Yeah, I think the maze games kind of have more of an impact on the future works of Ultimate that we know. But, I don't know, maybe that's debatable. But once you see things like Dingo, um... You'll notice similarities to, like, Sabrewolf and stuff. Anyway. There we go. Somehow made a second save state there, whatever. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, cool. It like named the saves names the save states based on your input, and I guess the first one is bound to the hotkey button and the other one is bound to like a controller button. I don't know. Anyway. So yeah. You could say this is a some vortex influence considering the asteroid mechanics where they break into small chunks. So there you go. There's lineage. <laughs> of course, holding down the button is, is a problem. Whoa, what? Okay, here's level three. Just hit that save state button. And yeah, the game has completely changed. <laughs> um, oh, no. Um, sorry, I accidentally hit the button, I guess. I didn't mean to. Oh, what's this song? I know this song. So button two now makes you accelerate. This is kind of like asteroids, actually. Uh, and then you sort of rotate. Oh no, all the... Okay, so it's still sort of directional controls, but you have a turning circle to it as well. And primary fire is, is your main fire now. So what's two, button two just boosts you forward, but pressing a directional input makes you go in that direction anyway. So it's actually pretty difficult to control um, compared to asteroids. Almost like they put this in an engine that wasn't meant for it. <laughs> but yeah, really interesting how they change it up just for this level or possibly other levels in the future, but yeah, it's cool. Oh, the fighter jets just keep coming. Oh, okay. Well, we got to level three. That's what I wanted to do. Um, Stuart Campbell says it turns into time pilot at that point for some reason, which is a... Uh... Oh, who made that one? 
is that Konami? I think that's Konami. That's similar to that kind of free roaming shooter thing like that. So kind of an evolution of asteroids. Um, yeah, woof. That was uh, intense. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I gotta catch my breath. Woof. Right. So that was the shooters of um, Ashby Computers and Graphics or Xilek. Oh, and by the way, you can see on the right the flyer for Saturn um, by Jaleco. So I guess it got a Japanese release as well, um, which is nice for them. Getting that international exposure. But yeah, you can see the ship looks a bit more gray than what we saw in game. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's move on. Um, the next thing I've got is an interesting one. It's The Pit, 1982. This is, uh, in a certain um, magazine article, it was credited as the first published work by the Stampers, but then we found out that they had those earlier shooters as well. But this is actually uh, not their own work. Unlike a lot of the other ones I'm playing today, this is an, a conversion of uh, an existing game or a game that was being developed. Um, so let me see. Yeah, Xilex there. AW Electronics is also associated with this game. Um, you can actually see on that on that screen AW and Zilek and uh, Zil Zilek Zilek, <laughs> uh, both given there. And in the console ports of this game, the word Zonka on that tank there is replaced with Zilek or uh, what's the other one? Um, Century. They did the U.S. distribution of the arcade game. Anyway. Um, this is a game that Andy Walker and Tony Gibson designed. Uh, the Stampers, Chris and Tim, converted it to arcade Galaxian boards. So this is what I was thinking of before. It's running on the Namco Galaxian hardware. Um, so they did that conversion and did a good job, according to him, according to Andy Walker in an interview. Uh, yeah, the really interesting thing about this, as <laughs> Gibbon points out in chat, this is a bit Boulder Dash, isn't it? And indeed, this predates Boulder Dash. Um, and in fact, directly inspired Boulder Dash, the creator of Boulder Dash, um, saw this game and said, oh, that looks nice. Um, I'll do something a little bit like that, won't I? Um, Andy Walker claims that it also inspired Dig Dug. So Dig Dug has similar gameplay to Boulder Dash and The Pit here. Um, he, yeah, he tells this story, which is re again recounted in uh, Stuart Campbell's thread, where he was showing a prototype version of this game off at a trade show or something, and some Japanese executives were there. He doesn't know where they're from. <laughs> Might have been uh, Namco. Um, so that's what he likes to say, is that this is both the game that inspired Boulder Dash and Dig Dug, both huge titans of uh, the gaming scene at the time and inspiring many imitators. But this is the progenitor of those games, and the stampers are involved in it, which is really cool and interesting stuff. So this game was pretty popular. Um, on the left, you can see the arcade machine for it, which shows you some of the art that was um, used to advertise the game. I couldn't find a flyer specifically, but it also got home ports to the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20. And on the right is a standalone portable <laughs> machine based on this game, put out by Bandai. It was also licensed um, in the US by Tandy, yes and it was known as Zackman. So the main character is the astronaut explorer, but also could be called Zackman or whatever. Zakuman, I don't know what that means in Japanese, but um, yeah, clearly it was a popular product at the time, and this is 1982. So yeah, it's either that it inspired Dig Dug or they were developed you know, semi-independently and released around the same time. So this is coming out within months of, of Dig Dug. Um, anyway, let's have a game. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, I'll actually reset just because there was a bit of a sort of blurb there. Oh, here we go. Let's turn it down to slow. That'll help me out. <laughs> 
time limit long short wives more wives please let's just get ahead of this <laughs> um, but yeah there's some interesting mechanics at play here um, which I'll talk about but let's take a look at that intro screen the object of this game is to dig down to the bottom pit and collect at least one large jewel then return to ship through upper pit single bonus 5,000 points collect one large jewel etc uh, etc et so yeah you get down there you dig them out you get as many jewels as you can and then you escape so we've got our ship up there but soon after we arrive um, some rivals appear with a tank and they're going to be digging through as well to get to us and attack us you can move freely in here but the boulders operate under gravity which is similar to boulder dash and stuff and we have a shot um, which is a bit like Dig Dug, you can also attack in that, but it's um, purely directional here, left and right, um, instead of going in four directions like um, our friend Taizo Hori is able to do. Uh, so let's grab some gems, let's not get too greedy, but I will go into the bottom cavern just because it's a bit of a different gameplay space down there. With these dangerous things oh okay if you spend too long in here they start falling and you get zonked zonk interesting interesting so you don't want to be too greedy but um yeah as we saw in the attract mode one of the ways you can return to your ship is via uh, this chamber here but if you walk over that floor it starts to disappear and that oh and of course you can be crushed by boulders just like in boulder dash uh, but this is a one-way passage up here because as soon as you dig past this boulder you can you can't get back So you have to go through the creature chamber to return and the other uh, Factor increasing the tension here is the time limit of the tank shooting through the mountain at your ship and if it manages to um, Shoot all the way through then your ship gets blown up. So you can't take too long so there's a lot of things happening here, there's a lot going on, um, and it's all kind of bespoke content throughout this large map, and I really like that, um, how large it is and how small you are in comparison. Looks like these are happening in random order. Oh, what? I thought I grabbed the crystals, but I guess not. Oops! Ah, curses. Last man. <laughs> yeah, zonk! is a great little onomatopoeia. Um, of course, PC Dungeon, I played that pretty recently on the PC Engine CD. The cyborg, Punkic Cyborgs shooter, whoops, nuts. You gotta be quick and you gotta be precise. I have earned the greatest score of 300. Awesome, oh, 10,300, oh, pardon me. Uh, yes, more credits, please. So yeah, I maybe won't spend too long on this because it's, you know, not really a, an original work by the Stampers and, and Lathbury. But it, that heritage is so fascinating. Um, and yet I never... I've never heard of this game, I never hear anyone talk about it. Um, Boulder Dash certainly made more of a splash. Maybe it had more uh, replayability or something, I don't know. Let's not be too greedy, I'll grab one and then leave. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it's tricky, lining yourself up with the, the gap. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't know that they could ascend. I thought they would fall down like the rocks, but I got totally zonked by an enemy robot or whatever they are. I do wonder how they translated this to the portable. Those are little like LCD based, um, you know, self-contained devices. You can see the screen of it on the sort of the print, not the, it, it's the box of the, of the device that I've got um, pinned up there in the stream layout. Um, how does that look, by the way? Yeah, it looks okay. Oh, dang it. Um, I thought I switched over the dimming, so 
that the the side art is dimmer than it usually is up till now in my streams so that the game stood out a bit more um, I think that came out okay and you can still see it yeah I think this is working I started with 30% and then for a long time I used 50% opacity but I've now upped it to 75% yeah I'm sure everyone needs to know this anyway um all right let's leave now get at least one run where I just smash and grab oh oh yeah that was a risk but I did it okay okay we just gotta be careful here yes nailed it because I think that's the one part of the game where gravity does affect you and you will fall down into the monster pit okay um hello I got some crystals, let me out. What's going on? Um, hold on a second. Input this machine. Button one. Oh, I don't have a map to anything. No, I do, it just is going off screen. So you only have one button and I've tried that button. That's your gun. Yeah. Pew, pew, pew. Um, let me out, please. <laughs> no. Oh, it left without me. Ugh. Maybe you need to get one of the super big gems. And the other ones are optional. Hmm. Yeah, it was like bonus for one gem is a certain thing, but bonuses for more gems are bigger. But I think maybe the big gems are necessary to leave. Um, did it say that already? <laughs> uh, I don't know if it said that, but I've, I've grokked it now. I understand the game. You need to get a big gem. Smaller gems are optional, but add to your score. <clears throat> Yoink. <laughs> oh no! Got zonked again. By the zonker. Not by the zonker. By whatever that thing is. It's a bit like in Metroid. What are those ones called that hang on the ceiling and come down and smash you what are those called i don't know all right this time it'll be a smash and grab very simple get one diamond get out the pit <laughs> gibbon has been tested on metroid knowledge her mind has gone blank much like mine i don't know what they're called i don't know any of the names of metroid enemies like, I know that Metroid shoots a lot of aliens, but I don't know what his alien enemies are called. Just kidding. Um, there's a lot of weird aliens on Zebus and SR388 and on F Talos 4. Talon 4, sorry. I was thinking of Talos. Gibbon feels like a fake Metroid fan. Yeah, me too. It's cool. Who's gonna judge you? Real Metroid fans? Those people. Though you don't want to be one of those people. <laughs> uh, have I mentioned that I've made a like uh, fan timeline of the Metroid series? Yeah, I'm a I'm a big Metroid nerd. And yes, I included all the comics, because that's what I do. Oh, I thought I had space there. The hitbox on that was enormous. I actually managed to get all the gems this time. Like I said, I wasn't going to do. Scree, that's it. Thank you, Gibbon. The Scree are those little pins of things that hang off the ceiling of caverns and swoop down on you and then explode, which seems to me to be a very, you know, counterintuitive adaptation for a creature to have, uh, you know, it's not going to help you survive very well if you blow yourself up immediately. <clears throat> very strange. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was referring to, given <laughs> Telos from Doctor Who, the home of the Cybermen, originally. Not originally, but the first time you see them anyway. Where are they from originally? I guess Mondas, but they do make that claim in season 10 or series 10 that 
wherever people are, Cybermen eventually spring up. It's inevitable. Uh, uh. That was dang close. Okay. Let's go. Yes. We're there. No, not now. I swear my controller has not had these issues for a while. There we go. Having got one of the big gems, we managed to escape. Congratulations. And that screen left very quickly, but here we can see that this is the same layout. So unless you get another different layout from getting all the gems, I'm going to assume that this is all that we have to see of this game. Um, I didn't prepare the ports of this one because it's not technically a, a thing created by the Stampers. It's something that they converted, but it's it was so interesting to gaming history in general that um, I thought it was worth a look. Um, yeah, okay, so that's the pit. Let's move on. So the next thing I have at the owl mark, we're going into the proper Ashby Maze Games, ACG Maze Games, starting with Blueprint. So Blueprint is probably one of their more successful works. They partnered with Bally Midway um, for US distribution, as well as Jaleco for the Japan. Um, let me see, switch this one over. Oh yeah, here you can see the three different uh, versions of this. Um, hang on, I need to get this bigger so I can see it. So, and I'll just, I'll just show you this. I, I couldn't find a flyer for the UK release, but in um, the US, what we've got is on the right here, that's the, the flyer for the arcade release. The enemy character is portrayed as like a big loutish rugby player. And the player character is kind of, um, I don't know, a strange little clown. <laughs> um, so that's the Bally US flyer. The Jaleco flyer, on the other hand, is a bit different. Uh, oh, well, this is the, the cover art of the home release, which shows you as like a massive nerd with a bow tie and a knitted pullover. But the the Japanese release by Jaleco had a funny... Ugh, sorry, I'm, I don't know which... Yeah, okay, there it is. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of more cutesy anime style thing. The character, the, the enemy character in game does look more like this blob, <laughs> like a jelly bean on roller skates. Um, and the player character in the background there looking very goofy. But let's, yeah, let's set this up. Sorry, move that there. <laughs> uh, how was it before? I think that's fine. <laughs> All right. So let's launch that game. Blueprint. Sorry, hang on. Um, oh, what? Hang on. All right. Blueprint. Midway. This is the Midway release that I'm playing. And I'll just make sure that we can all see that. Right, so um, this is when the Stampers and John Lathbury started getting into maze games. Um, according to documentation around the US ports, the enemy character is Ollie Ogre, and he's menacing uh, the girlfriend of the player character who is named JJ and her name is Daisy Damsel so very much telegraphing her role in the game unfortunately um, oh yeah given commenting on the pit I like this one in particular it's very ambitious I don't know something about it yeah indeed um, it was groundbreaking pioneering indeed uh, but yes blueprint here we can see it now. That looks fine. Okay, I think that's all right. Um, yeah, so the setup is, uh, I called it a maze game. Um, it's a, it's kind of mazy, I guess. Um, some enemies will pop out later to try and menace you, but the idea is you're running into these different houses to get parts of your machine, and then you're assembling them at the bottom uh, of the screen there. Sometimes you get a bomb. Oh no. Uh, so you have to run the bomb down to the bomb pit. 
otherwise you're assembling a machine and the machine once built and it's a kind of wacky silly contraption um, that attacks Oliogre in some way and thus frees your uh, lady friend from his malign influence starring JJ and there's a little character we can see um, Tim Stamper created that character and, and the art for that character collect all parts and assemble machine from the blueprint when complete start the machine and use it to destroy the monster before it catches the girl you can see they don't even have names in this release uh, the the names um, and the names of the enemies Fuzzy Wuzzy and Sneaky Pete they all uh, originate from the manuals and box blurbs from the ports which was for Atari 2600, Atari 5200 and Commodore 64 thanks to uh, the Bally Midway partnership those were all created for the US market um, otherwise the credits in the code for the arcade version here include Chris Stamper, John Lathbury and Tim Stamper names that we've heard before of course and yeah the graphics I, I said that um, Tim Stamper designed the character we know this because on his short lived Twitter account in Tim's world which you might remember was teasing things like a project dream cartridge inside a giant block of ice and some old concept art and stuff I don't know if it was promoting any new Fortune Fish products but it probably should have been uh, Croco Bongo, taken too soon. Pour one out. Anyway, um, he posted some uh, concept art, pixel art of JJ with a different kind of hat saying, oh, we changed the hat for the final release. So that was kind of a piece of evidence before we dug into the code on um, the fact that ACG had even made this game because that was a bit unknown. Um, yeah, all right. So I think we can get started from that point. Given says... Oh, right. No, Given might have been talking about this one, actually. She says, Blueprint is also very ambitious. There's a lot going on here. Indeed, there is a lot. It might get a little chaotic, but let's um, see how we go. I do like how that music kind of builds as the... as the, that logo fills in, building the tension. It's very cool. So, yeah, we need to... I think that's Fuzzy Wuzzy... Or maybe Sneaky Pete, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, we just need to avoid that guy because, um, well, for one thing, they're causing all of my assembled parts to fall to the floor, but they're also blocking my access to the start button. Once we finally assemble the machine, we do need to... Ah, oh, nuts, it jumped right into me. Now, that's a very uh, Mario-style move there to fall on your back and then have a little halo appear before you float away to death. Um, that definitely happens in Donkey Kong. <laughs> so that's a bit of influence there. Before, long before Rare ever took on Donkey Kong themselves. So I think the problem is going into the same house twice will um, usually get your bomb. So, oh, okay. Oh, and now that that other thing's gone, I can reassemble stuff. You do need to make sure all the parts are there, of course. Ugh, not you again. So this is the crank. I like how this kind of... There's like a layer at the bottom that's part of... Ugh, they knocked a flower pot onto me, how rude. Yeah, there's this layer down there that seems like it's almost part of the UI, but it's also traversable. You're walking around down there. It, it's something that if you think about it doesn't really make physical sense, but yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So how many more bits do we need? I think we just need that tube and we're done. So I don't think I've been in this house over here, but I'm not sure if you have to go in houses that you haven't done before. Oh, a red bomb. How is that different? It's quicker. Great. <laughs> and that's it. We're dead already. Um, you can see that uh, the UI here, the font and all that sort of stuff, the coloration, all very similar to satin, um, which would belie the the connection there in the back end with the developers, if you didn't already know. Um, bonus life at lower points. Mo maze monster appears in second maze or third maze. So leave that a second. I want to see this maze monster. Um, yep, coins for credits is fine because I have infinite credits. Give us more lives. Give us less difficulty. And then we'll have a nice go at it. Try and assemble that machine. So yeah, it's a cool concept. Um, what threw me off a bit was the 
the name of the game Blueprint. Often it's rendered with a space uh, when you see it written, but actually on the Blueprint itself it doesn't have a space, and I believe that's more correct. I think the hyphen actually denotes that it is one word, but I guess people ignore that, I don't know. Uh, so searching for it can be a bit tricky. I think usually you, you put the space in and then you can find it. Oh, yeah, watch out for the flower pot. That must be the fuzzy wuzzy that's inside the flower pot. Um, but also, yeah, you can't take too long, otherwise um, the monster will catch up to the girl. Um, and she's just running away and the jelly bean is chasing her. I do like the art style on the Jellico Flyer. It's very cute. Not so much with the Bally one, but that's fine. Ugh, go away. Oh, I see what's happening. So once that monster hits the start button, if the machine hasn't been fully assembled, then it just falls apart if you try to start it. That actually makes sense. Um, ah, there's that pipe I was missing before. So it says bomb pit, but also monster pit. But if you try and like grab this... Oh, okay. All right. Okay, I didn't know about that. <laughs> you can grab that monster and drop them in the pit. Okay, cool. Good to know. <laughs> I was just waiting for it to go away, but yeah. Oh, um, that's the other thing. Fast run. I forgot all about that. That's probably how you deal with the red bomb as well. But, oh, come on. There we go. Oh, dang it. I ran out of time because the, the monster caught the girl and it said very snarkily, have you even read the instructions? Yes, I know how to how this game works. And I cannot screen wrap apparently. But yeah, down the bottom of the very bottom of the screen there's a um, there's a bar fast run time. If you hold down the fire button, you actually do run faster, uh, limited by the size of that bar. So I only have one more thing to grab. And it's not that. Come on. The problem with fast run is it's harder to turn. I don't know, again, I don't know if this is an emulator issue with the inputs, but um, I think you have to release. Oh, come on. I have to, have to stop doing that. It's so fast. I've only got one more component and I have to stop going into the same house. No, not a red one again. Go. No. How did that not go in? I didn't overlap it enough. That's really annoying. Okay, that's fine. We'll have another go. Um, yeah. So I call this a maze game. I don't know if that's really accurate, but... Of course, maze games. There is a genre started by Pac-Man. But as you can see with this kind of thing, or... It kind of reminds me of Onyanko Town, which I played on the Famicom a while back in my Mother Animal Showcase where it was a similar kind of Pac-Man setup but set in a town um, so the, the sort of play field grid was a bit more chaotic and themed which was fun but we get a similar thing happening here with this kind of suburban or almost like English country town lots of hedgerows everywhere small houses. Oh, come on. I wonder if I can hide in... Oh! Hide in a house from a flower pot. I haven't tested that yet, I don't think. Oh, great. Now, which houses have I not gone in? Ah, flower pots. Oh, seriously? You're getting better, says the game. Thanks for the encouragement. Two more parts after this. Are they randomly assigned? Because they definitely... Ah! Um, I definitely... Had yet to get the pipe last run. Is it the top corner? No, that's not it. I knew it. Is it here? No. Yeah, it's testing your memory at this point. Um, this one? Nope. Ah! <laughs> Good try, you almost had it. You almost did it. Yeah, luckily your progress is saved between lives. That's nice. Oh, this must be infuriating to watch, but I cannot remember which houses I have and have not been in yet. 
There's only one more to get. I just need to be more methodical about it, but the sort of way the hedgerows are arranged makes it a little more tricky to do that. There we go. Now, finally, we press start. Oh, I've never done this before. So the machine <laughs> is some kind of ball shooter. Uh, and we have to try and hit the monster, I guess. The jelly bean. Yes. <laughs> How strange. <laughs> I guess this game is part shooter as well. Again, we're seeing that kind of shift in genre part way through like how Saturn did turning into a take on time what was it time pilot anyway we have a new layout for the maze here as well as the maze monster as we saw in the dip switch but I can hide in a house from it oh no it's bomb ah ah so close so things are getting ramped up and complicated very soon here um, as well as the new maze to contend with. Now, I've been in there already, and it was a bomb last time. I do like JJ, though. He's a very strange-looking fellow, but kind of fun for a protagonist. Like, I really don't know what his deal is. He's as colorful as the Saturn ship again. Very Spectrum-ish colors, almost, with those bright... Oh! Dang it. Cyan and magenta and green and yellow. They're all there. Seriously. It's just that you can have a lot more colors on one sprite in the arcade than you could on the spectrum. All right, shall we try again? What's the time? 1.16. What have we got to do? Um, okay, I think we've covered that pretty well. So what I want to actually do now is jump out and have a look at the ports of this game and see how they change it up. Um, like I said, Bally did a few uh, home ports for this one. Um, yep, yeah, so I know what I'm doing now. Go here. Ah, go away. Uh, oh, which one's which? Yep, yeah, okay. That's really loud. Oh, that's horrible. Okay, I'll turn that down, sorry. But yes, ports, our first ports for today. Oh, can we stop that, please? <laughs> Until I get the window up. Okay, one second. Yeah, so a bit like, I don't know, Skyskipper. We got an arcade game being ported to the Atari 2600 here. Uh, or, or say Donkey Kong, for example. But um, yeah, like... Like Gibbon was saying, um, Blueprint is fairly ambitious and uh, a little bit complex. So it's interesting to see how they've converted it for a much weaker platform here on the Atari 2600. Um, let's start. Oh, the jingle is still here. Might turn that up a bit, actually. Okay, there it is. Um, so yeah, the setup is similar. Um, we still have a speed up button. But, ah, see, this is this is something I took a little while to figure out and had to consult the manual. Um, the machine works differently in this game. Um, so I, my sprite actually changed to a bomb there because I guess they can only display one at a time. <laughs> but all the mechanics are here. The maze monster is actually uh, has appeared in the first round, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, there's sort of parts of this machine that are already filled up. And you need to fill up the rest of them, but only in order. If you get the wrong one, you just return it to the house you found it in. Um, uh, otherwise, yeah, you have to assemble them from bottom to top. And I assume in later rounds it gets... Oh, that's cool. They've shifted the palette, which kind of implies a change in time from daytime to evening. Oh, and night. Oh, that's so quick. That's really cool. And that's just something simple that you can do with the Atari 2600 palettes. Everything else has stayed the same. All right, time is running out, but I know where the last one is now. So we'll just run up to this last house, grab that up. Oh, we ran out of time. So we can't animate the sprite falling over. That is so piercing. I gotta turn that down again, sorry. <laughs> All right, I've lost a bit of time there, but that's right. Oh, um, again, we've kept our progress. 
Uh, the yellow dot, I guess, is the number of lives remaining, so we still have another chance. So grab the top part of the machine, assemble it in order, run over to the start button, and here we go. Oh, this is totally different. Password. Okay, so the password, gunpower. We can only have one shot at a time and it's incredibly slow. <laughs> um, wow, okay. How am I supposed to... <laughs> By sheer luck, I hit the enemy. Okay, cool. Ah, oh, amazing. <clears throat> and so Ollie Ogre, as he's named in this version, has run over to my machine and trashed it distributing the parts around and as I speculated um, there are more parts to collect in round two to assemble it again so yeah cool stuff um, that's the Atari 2600 version and just admire that sprite of Daisy up there beautiful stuff again reminiscent of um, the way Pauline looks in the arcade in the uh, Atari 2600 um, Donkey Kong port <laughs> Milo the sharpshooter says Gibbon. Mm, thank you. So the cover art we have in the middle of the screen here is indeed the 5200 um, version and that's the one I want to show off now so I'll just change the window over and we'll see how a machine that's double the numbers can double our fun. Okay CBS presents Blueprint Oh wow, look at that. So here we can see something that's much closer to the arcade original um, and they've used their additional power to yeah, make something that's more faithful. But in the process, I don't know, with these kind of things I often do find that I appreciate how the limitations of the much less powerful platform has sometimes result in things that maybe are more interesting or different. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say I like the 5200 port better than this one. <laughs> but yeah, they've got the same maze layout from Arcade. I guess that would be a good selling point for the time, is that you can bring something that you've seen in the Arcade, you can bring it home uh, with you um, and play it any time you want, and that would have been really um, mind-blowing um, for people, even if, you know, the graphics aren't quite as good, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, it's still, yeah, it still was a selling point for sure. No, go away Fuzzy Wuzzy, or Sneaky Pete, I don't remember. Yes, okay, we've grabbed the monster, chuck him in the pit. Lovely stuff. I wonder if... oh, okay, it's another bomb. Uh, they've even got the fast run time bar over there. I don't know if they were representing fast run time in, on 2600. There was that other bar on screen, maybe that was it. Um, oh, flower pot's coming. Oh, nuts. It's okay, hopefully we'll, yeah, save our progress. We've actually got four lives in this version. Um, I, I didn't note or I, I didn't find out um, who is responsible for the ports, whether there's credits. This is at the time when developers weren't really being credited very often in in-game, so we might not really know, but considering how close this is to the Stamper's work, Ooh, okay. <laughs> Much easier to uh, land a hit in this one. Okay, cool. So what's this? Yeah, this is the the same altered layout for Maze 2. Nice. Um, by the way, I didn't note it before, but there is a kind of Pac-Man mechanic to this. You do run automatically in the direction that you last pressed, and then if you're holding to the side, you can corner at the next turn. Um, so that's a kind of Pac-Man-esque mechanic that has continued here, thus proving that they're both in the same genre. Oh, and um, by the way, note that Daisy's sprite looks a lot more natural in this version. Yeah, looking good. Uh, JJ, very strange, um, especially the front-facing sprite <laughs> with that wide smile. Looks quite odd, I'd say. Anyway. So that's um, Atari 5200, let's cut that off there. I think we're finished with that emulation system. So now what I want to play real quick is the Commodore 64 port. We won't spend too long on it. How do I get that? X64, I guess, yeah, okay. And then 
Where's my recently? Oh, I'll just do this one. Okay. What's this game called again? Blueprint. Yeah. I had trouble finding the right format of file for this. Just change it over here. What's this? This one. Okay. Blueprint, Commodore 64 edition. <clears throat> Starring JJ. Oh, okay. We've got this whole intro sequence like the arcade. That's nice. And the blueprint looking fly as heck. Even in-game instructions. Wow. Yeah, the Commodore 64. It's pretty cool. Right. <laughs> Giving us into this. That's cool. I like seeing you post ooh in the chat. It's lovely. Oh, wow. Look at Daisy in this version. <laughs> that is interesting. Uh, but yeah, we've got all the same mechanics here. Um, the run bar is at the very top of the screen this time. Ugh. Yeah, I had to get the De Bomb Pit, but the Flower Pot monster was in the way. We do have an animated death sprite this time, which is nice. But otherwise, everything looks pretty similar. The graphics are maybe less detailed than the 5200 version. But I think JJ's sprite looks a lot better, actually. That's interesting. I could see um, Sneaky Pete poking uh, his head out of the monster pit there. But I was actually able to stop him with a bomb dropped in there. So that's interesting. Okay, That could even be a little strategy that he might use. Okay, just... Oh, what? Whoa! Oh, that was a bit of unpredictable movement from the flower pot there. Okay, let's drop this off and then drop Sneaky Pete off. Come on. Okay. And I've run out of run. Dang. I'll have to let that recharge, if possible. Oh! I also have fewer lives in this version. I think... Have I lost one or two so far? Anyway. We don't have many. Taking it slow to let my run build up a bit more. Hopefully we could get to at least see a loop of this. And I know which houses I haven't been to. I've learned to pay attention to that now. Let's use a bit of run to speed back over here. Should be these top two. Yep, so it's a thousand points for picking that up and then go and drop it off. Again, um, fairly faithful replication of the arcade game here, which is nice. <clears throat> Come on. Oh, yeah, just be careful about that. Okay, last one. And press start. Okay, uh, yep. Again, similar mechanic here. Boom! <laughs> Gibbon says, I miss my C64. <laughs> mm. Well, we've always got emulators, and they load much faster than the real machine. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that, that'll do it for Blueprint. You got to see how it was converted to these other platforms. Um... And that's really the last one here that has an official contemporary port. Uh, so yeah, I guess Blueprint was pretty successful for them. So good for them um, on that one. So what do I do now? Quit. Yes. So now we're going to look at the follow-up to Blueprint. And it's called Grass Pin. Grass Pin? Grass Spin? It is unclear. But... I'll load it up for you. I would call it in the same lineage, if only because of the protagonist, but there are no problems with this machine. It may not perfectly show the graphics, unfortunately. But yeah, again, this is Zilek. This is 1983. Um, ACG is credited for this specifically on certain lists that I found. Uh, but yeah, we do know that um, that those guys were involved because of the code that we've dug into or that other people have um, listed are Chris Stamper and John Lathbury, or rather John Lath. The, the credits are a little bit cut off. So Tim Stamper's name might be there as well. Uh, the 
was not visible in the code who knows but I, I will say that the appearance of the protagonist in this game is pretty similar to JJ. Um, so even if, you know, it's enough for me to say, yeah, this is the further adventures of JJ, so this is essentially a sequel. Um, but even if not that, then the style of it uh, is a bit of an indicator that it's Tim Stamper um, style. Uh, yes, so what else? <laughs> Yeah, according to the Reverend Stuart Campbell, the music is a tweaked version of Namco's New Rally X theme, which itself is based on the Pac-Man intermission theme. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, so the objective is to grab flags um, and to avoid these enemies, but you can spin the grass, grass spin, to, uh, like, deal with them. In some cases. Also, Gibbon, I believe these are crabs, are they not? Uh, maybe this should be submitted to Does This Video Game Have a Crab in It Twitter? Alright, grass spin. Grass spin. Whatever you want to call it. Uh, oh yes, so the button, the, um, the fire button will uh, spin all these panels. We don't want to let that bird catch us or get trapped by the crabs, but we want to arrange the maze. So we have full control over the maze at all times, really. Um, well, not full. It sort of has two configurations that you swap between, and you just have to position yourself carefully. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Rude. Perhaps it should. Well, um... Maybe I'll take a screenshot. Uh, how do I do that? <laughs> how do you take a screenshot in MAME? Uh, input general, user interface. Oh my gosh. This is always so woo, overwhelming. Um, save snapshot, F12, not left shift. Okay, I can do that. Okay, F12, where's that? This one. Did that work? Who knows? I'll find out later. I'll check the files. Um, yes, I also want to check the dip switch because this, this is actually quite a difficult game. Um, I've already had a quick run and, and been utterly bodied very easily. So we'll just turn our lives up and I guess that's all we can do. So that's fine. Hit reset. Have another go. So yeah, the, the, the character, you know, a bit like in... Um, blueprint it has this kind of strange like Marcel Marceau mime clown look to them that is a little odd but it works <laughs> I guess they're very colorful that's what I like is how many different colors are there on the sprite oh go away bird they, it just beelines straight for you or bird lines as the crow flies I can't really tell what that other cr critter is supposed to be but I think I should go back to the attract mode for a bit because there is a way to kill these permanently, right? You can sort of stun them by spinning the grass at certain times um, and trap them in little alcoves, but you always have to spin to keep moving and keep traversing and open up those flag panels. Now, what is this? What's going on with this scrolling thing? You can go all the way to the edge of this screen. But then you just come straight back. I don't understand that at all. <laughs> just do it up here as well. Oh, you fall down. There's like waterfalls on the side of the screen. So it's a quick escape, I guess, if something's chasing you at the top of the screen, is you can just pop over to there and, and fall down. What happened? What? What happened? Excuse me? Oh, maybe, um, maybe the red grass is deadly? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm finding this game a bit baffling. Um, maybe we can see why I didn't enjoy the success that uh, the blueprint did. Because it's a little bit odd. Oh, I see. So what I've done is actually picked up the life preserver from the side of the screen and then used that to ride the waterfall down. I wonder what happens if you don't have one. <laughs> um, Let's grab this flag. One more to go. I'll test it out. No, I'll get the flag first. I'll test it later. <laughs> I don't want to lose my progress. OK, 
Okay, so that's level 1 done, I guess. No bonus, unlucky. How high can you try? How high can you try? That's the... What? That's the same text in Donkey Kong, isn't it? No, that's how high can you get. Yeah, maybe... Uh, hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's how high you can get, isn't it? Yeah, okay. How high can you get? I remember that because I wrote a... Uh, you know, quote unquote witty caption for a screenshot of that screen saying, How high can you get? Making a reference to illicit substances. Aren't I clever? <laughs> Imagine that. Anyway. Um, yeah, so the grass has changed to blue now, which is not a color that grass often is, but it denotes a an increase in difficulty, I suppose. What? Oh no, I flipped the crab right into me. And there's a very creepy animation when you get hit where your head entirely spins around. They should call this game Head Spin. Yeah, that was for honorable mention this game. Oops. Uh, okay. Well, the enemy doesn't hurt you when they're stunned, but that one recovered really quickly. I did say I was going to check out the track mode, so I'll do that now. Maybe get a bit of a better idea on how the game works exactly. Oof. Okay. Grass spin. Stay hydrated. So yeah, Japanese names on the high score table pre-filled. Um, I assume they're Jaleco reps. But we do know that the ACG team did create the game originally here. Yeah. <clears throat> that might be specifically added for the Japanese release or something, I don't know. I wonder if you get a bonus for doing them in the right order. I think that's what it's implying there. And yeah, the red grass turning onto them. Yeah, I think I was right about the red thing, so let's try that this time. And we'll try and get the bonus this time too, see if there's a bonus stage or if it just gives you points. So... Yeah, even spinning the red grass does nothing to the bird, but I think having the life preservers... Oh, seriously? <laughs> having the waterfall as an escape route is a, is a way to get distance from the bird, I suppose, if it's creeping up on you. Boom! Oh, no, I was only watching that one crab in the red grass. Hmm. Okay, so we're going to do them in order this time. What?! It threw a projectile at me. There was a beach ball. What the heck? <laughs> Dang it. What is that creature anyway? It's very strange. I think I've lost too much progress now. Just reset. Um, okay. Boom. Oh, they've changed position. Uh, okay. So that's the sort of randomness element here. <laughs> Given says, the game keeps throwing surprises at you. It sure does. Very disorienting at times. Yeah, that other little crit is gone. Oh, it's back. So if I move this... Nah, I'll just... Yeah, just focus on getting the flags. You can deal with the crabs. Or you can just focus on progress. So, yeah, I think it's about positioning yourself relative to those dots is important. Oh gosh, that was intense. <laughs> but that little guy is in there. Can we get rid of that? Come on, leave. Oh, it died somehow. Ta da! That's all the flags in order. Good, says the game. We got a 5,000 bonus for getting the flags in order. And then we're on to maze two. Oof. Okay, um, looking at the time, I think we're making good progress and I think we should move on to Dingo now as the last game, because there are also a couple of ports associated with that. So this was Grass Spin, the second and final title in the JJ series, I'm gonna say, after Blueprint, the saga of this, of this guy. What am I actually trying to do in this game? get flags, but why? Am I a lifeguard or what? 
What's the premise of the Game Watch title flag, man? That's semaphore. That's specifically signaling something. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. Grass, waterfalls. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> I I can't even come up with a justification for this to craft a story around this game. It's just do these things just because. Oh well, that's fine. So moving on to our final phase of the stream today, Dingo. Now I should sh spend a bit of time talking about this because this is, on the left is a bit of Tim Stamper art repurposed for a later fan re-release of the game. Um, he drew this for the cabinet artwork. Oh, Gibbons giving us some lore, that's lovely. So Gibbons uh, attempted lore is, I don't think they're waterfalls, I think it's the tide and it's a beach or something. You know what, that makes perfect sense actually. Yeah. There was sand there, it's the beach, flags, um, blow up uh, rings, that all works. So JJ's got a job as a lifeguard. There's crabs, because it's a beach, there's a bird. Yeah, that actually all works. Um, the grass is the sand dune grass, and you can move it because it's actually artificial grass that they've put in the dunes to preserve them against erosion which is a very big problem. If you remove vegetation from dunes, then the sand is not gonna, is gonna move, it's gonna leave. Um, and that's really bad for the ecology of the area. So awesome stuff. And I guess he's collecting the flags because it's the end of the day. Yeah, or something, who knows? Um, at least that gives us a theme to work with. So thanks very much for clearing that up for me. <laughs> it's good. All right, as for Dingo, um, well, I'll talk about it in a minute, but it looks like there's a dragon on the left. Um, and we can see our player character just next to the dragon sprite. That's Big Ted the Koala. On the right is a, a mock-up cover art for the later Spectrum release, which again, I'll talk about later. But that's based on an in-game sort of title screen uh, screenshot, um, which I think probably is also by Tim Stamper in terms of the art. Oh, oh no, a really interesting thing about this one I'll bring up the game first, actually. Hold on. <clears throat> do, 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 do. Dingo. So like I said up top, if anybody knows about really early ultimate play the game, rare stampers work, then they might know about Dingo. Um, and the interesting thing that I just remembered about this is that we have a credit for um, Carol Ward in the code, as well as Chris Stamper, John Lathbury, and Tim Stamper. So what that tells me is that at this point, at least in 1983, um, they've formed their company ACG, and we can actually see a credit for that on the title screen down the bottom there, Ashby Computers and Graphics. Um, considering, oh, sorry, um, the volume is... I found that when I emulated this game, it makes this kind of clicking, like, noise that is unpleasant, and I apologize, but I, I don't know how to stop it. Um, you can even see the full logo and company name on the high score screen. Use the joystick to move Big Ted around the melon field. Dash to collect all the fruit before Dingo to help earn a time bonus. Dingo will squash Ted if he can be seen. Dingoes like to flatten and throw fruit, so chuck them back by using the fire button. So that tells you about the premise of the game. Um, we're Big Ted the Koala, and we apparently maintain a, a, a an orchard of sorts, a melon patch in the bush, although we have also bananas, lemons, strawberries, other kinds of berries, as well as melons. And yeah, dingoes are coming in to to eat us and to ruin our fruit harvests. Now, all this is behavior that real koalas do not have. They spend 99% of their time up a tree, but they have been known to be preyed on by dingoes if they venture from the tree to move to a different tree or whatever. So that's at least uh, accurate to real um, animals. Dingoes are really interesting. I'll, I'll talk about that later. But anyway, um, yeah, it's cool that Carol Ward is in there credited for art alongside Tim Stamper. So we have actually... Um, a woman with a with a video game credit in this early time, which is nice um, and uh, relatively rare. 
Uh, what else? Do, 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 do. Um, I'll also mention the visual similarity of this game to Saber Wolf, which, if you're familiar with that, has a similar kind of bright green jungly kind of thing with a lot of colors going on, and the maze game kind of thing, although it also translates the maze gameplay from a sort of action arcade experience to an adventure multi-screen scrolling kind of thing. So you can see the legacy here um, going from this game to Ultimate Slater uh, successful games on the spectrum, etc. Um, so each fruit we pick up can be used as a projectile, so we will run out if we use too many. Oh, actually, you only get one <laughs> at a time. So you can use one and then you have to pick up another one before you can throw again. Um, but you can also just try and run away from the dingoes. You get an extra bonus for picking up all the fruit without throwing any of them. Um, but throwing them is a good way to get the dingoes off your tail for a second. Boom. See, dingoes fallen over. Now, um, eagle-eyed uh, viewers may notice that the creature depicted on the cover, sort of the what would have been the cabinet artwork uh, on the left, <laughs> looks a bit more like a dragon or something. Uh, dingoes in real life are basically wild dogs, um, sort of pictured like a smaller wolf that's orange, um, suited for desert life, not very shaggy, that kind of thing. Um, I think the idea is that when the first um, Indigenous Australians first came here, you know, over a hundred thousand years ago from the continent, they either there would have been a land bridge at the time, or, or it would have been a smaller um, body of water that they could cross in canoes or something. But yeah, they had domesticated dogs at that point, and so. Technically, dingoes are an introduced species, but by this point, they've really integrated into the ecosystem of Australia. Um, they're essentially feral dogs, but they're, they're at this point, they're natives, you know. <laughs> um, oh, there you go with that message. Dingo will remember you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, dingoes. Oh, here we go. Um, melon, strawberry, lemon, blackberry, tomato raspberry and blackcurrant that's what we've got growing in our garden even though it calls it a, a melon patch um, and you can also see sort of the credit counter in the corner is similar to what we've seen in some of these other games even though the font for the, the rest of it is quite different um, yeah so there's a lineage there however small but I like how this can be seen as like a stepping stone then to like Saber Wolf as Gibbon says in chat it, it does look very Saber wolf -y, doesn't it um uh, what was I saying? Yeah, dingoes are the largest terrestrial predator in Australia. At least they are now. Um, if you go back, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, um, there was a lot of megafauna around here. Uh, marsupial, like tigers that are bigger than modern day tigers, giant wombats, like the size of an elephant. Um, mega kangaroos and all this stuff we have some really cool megafauna in our um, prehistory um, but they all sort of died out uh, and yeah dingoes is it dingoes that are the size of dogs are the largest uh, predator I guess the largest other thing we have would be like kangaroos but they're of course herbivores um, although that's not to say they would be dangerous um, if you cross them they have a very powerful kick as you might expect um, right, so just to catch up on chat there. Uh, um, Gibbon's saying, talking about the different fruits we have, walnuts, peanuts, and pineapple smells, grapes, melons, oranges, and coconut shells. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah, and so yeah, how the, the dingo message is very ominous. Also commenting on blackcurrants. Tasty, says Gibbon. Let me see. I wonder if I eat any of these things. I'm I'm fairly picky when it comes to fruit. I, I'm sorry to say. Um, I guess I'll eat a tomato if it's cooked into something. <laughs> Raw tomato makes me gag. I hate it. <laughs> well, never mind. I do like watermelon quite a bit, but I don't think it's those kinds of melons. These melons are like orange. I guess they're rock melons or cantaloupes. Oh yeah, the dingoes are purple in this game, but I'm not going to hold the color of anything against it because the the koala is also blue and red. 
Um, I hope you can hear this okay, because there's quite a nice jingle happening during gameplay. Very frantic. But yeah, you can see that the dingoes also sometimes grab fruit and throw it at you. Once I've thrown a fruit, I can't do it again until I pick up another one, as I've said. But yeah, those are the mechanics. Pretty simple. Um, but it's your, yeah, it's your arcade maze game kind of thing. Not even as complicated as Blueprint. Oh, I got too close to the dingo when I got up, did I? Yeah, I think... What? Oh, no, I guess a dingo crushed the last fruit. So that meant all the fruit was gone, which meant I passed the stage. Um, there's also a timer in the top left. I don't know what that's for exactly. But we can see that by passing to the next stage, it has increased the dingo count. We have more dingoes to deal with. <laughs> Given says she has an AC unit and nine fans going, so she can't hear much. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, how are you holding up with that heat wave? I hear it's been pretty bad up there. Sorry about that. Hope you're doing okay. Stay cool, everyone. I'm trying to stay warm today, of course, but yeah. Ugh, I had a really rough morning. I tried to cook a loaf of bread with a new recipe and royally screwed it up. I ended up with a very flat, dense, uh, undercooked. It, it was awful. <laughs> Did not work at all. Luckily we had some spare, so we'll have to find something else to eat tomorrow. Hmm. I have a regular recipe that I normally use. It's fairly reliable, but I tried something different and it didn't work out. That's how things go. Gibbon says, it seems to have peaked yesterday at just over 110 uh, degrees F, which I think stands for fake, fake temperatures that don't exist, um, but was quote unquote only in the 90s today. Yeah, I think that's around like 37, so very, very hot. Yeah, sorry to hear it. But hey, that's climate change. Yeah, you can actually, if you have a bit of space, like pop into a lane to grab the fruit and then move on. That's that's probably a viable strategy. Oh, I can't imagine doing this without ever throwing fruit. Whoops. Hey. That went well. <clears throat> Hundred and ten is forty three. Holy hell, that's really hot. Oh my goodness. No wonder everyone's complaining so much. <laughs> no, yeah, that's that's really rough. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Okay. Hmm. Oh, stage two clear. Do we get another dingo? Oh, Pac Man style intermission scene. Pac-Man was 1982, right? Or was it 81 as well? I don't remember. All right, looks like we've peaked at four dingoes for this stage. They might add more in later ones, but yeah, that's that's pretty much how the game goes. Um, I think we might have seen enough of this now. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I talked about this definitely post ACG formation, given that information on the title screen. So this could be like the start of, uh, you know, Ashby Computers and Graphics as a company representing the stampers themselves being in total ownership of a company, um, thus the direct successor to Ultimate Play the Game, or, you know, even, like I said up top, Jetpack was credited on the cassette inlay as being by Ashby Computers and Graphics, trading as Ultimate Play the Game. But um, yeah, I think it's worth uh, acknowledging their earlier work as well because they were still, uh, like I said, on the board of directors of Xylac. They were heavily involved. They were making those games entirely on their own. 
uh, Chris Tim and John Lathbury. Um, I didn't look up John Lathbury and see what he did later if he continued very far in Ultimate. I'll do that right now as we're just lingering on this screen for a bit. But I do have a couple of remakes of this game to show you. I'll just quickly search for John Lathbury. Gibbons says Pac-Man was 1980. Oh gosh. But didn't actually originate that formula. That distinction goes to Hey Ankyo Alien, which predates Pac-Man by a full year. Oh wow. I feel like I've heard of Hey Ankyo Hey Ankyo Alien. Um but yeah, I'm not really familiar with it with how it plays. Okay, so John Lathbury is credited on Blueprint uh, on Moby Games, a lot of these early games aren't actually in the Moby Games uh, database, but uh, he's also on Trans Am, Pist, Lunar Jetman, Jetpack, Dingo, Cookie, Attic Attack, Underworld, Saber Wolf, and Night Law. So, yeah, still programming on many of the foundational uh, early years Ultimate games for the Spectrum up until, uh, yeah, even Night Law in 1984, that seminal isometric uh, platformer that we've discussed a lot in previous streams. So yeah, good to know, but I guess uh, he didn't stay with the company, or he, he didn't stay in game development, according to Moby Games, after 1984. Too bad. Right, um, so that's Dingo. Now I want to show you a couple of remakes of Dingo by fans. Let me see, they're all in this folder. So why don't we go in release order. Um, 2008, cast your minds back. Let me just... Make sure this is up. Oops, no. Fiddling with OBS, hold on a second. Display. Oh, where'd it go? There, okay. Dingo version 1.2. Uh, released for the PC, but also at the 1.2 point, uh, got a Mac release. So that's nice. Um, Gibbon says, Hey, Ankyo Alien was ridiculously popular in Japan at the time but Pac-Man beat it to an international audience so that when Hey Ankyo Alien finally reached overseas, it was seen as a cheap Pac-Man knockoff and quickly fell out of the limelight. Oh gosh. That's an interesting story. Let me tell you a story about the 2008 Retro Remakes competition. I've played games from this before. If you cast your mind back to the Kiwi stream where I played Kiwi 64 and the Kiwi's Tale, um, which reframed Taito's uh, New Zealand story as having more Aotearoa-specific content in it, in it um, as well as, you know, remixing the gameplay and stuff, um, as well as the game Pauline's Way, a new adventure for the Atari 2600 Pauline from Donkey Kong, where she jumps around a maze shooting her shotgun at uh, robots and squishing rats, uh, if you remember that one. Uh, I've read that there was also a Sable Wolf remake within this competition. So lots of people making remakes of old games. It was a lot of fun, 2008. Um, I don't know if there's still a centralized uh, hub for those games that is still up, but this is one of the results of that, made by uh, Soren Borgquist, aka Sokura or Sokuran. Um, their, their games are all hosted at TARDIS Remakes. And there's a lot of cool stuff on there if you want to check it out. But they also made, yeah, this sort of modern remake of Dingo, as well as uh, a, a port of Dingo to the Spectrum, which is pretty fascinating. Um, I'll just adjust the stream layout so you can still see those lovely Tim Stamp artworks. Okay. Um, actually, where is that art from? Maybe that's new art on the right. Hmm. So I didn't see it in, in game. Anyway, that's fine. Uh, what else do I have to say? So credits on the ZX Spectrum version say that graphics, music, and art were done by Mark R. Jones. I'm not sure about this version of the game, though. Um, go to help. Use keys or joypad to move Big Ted around the melon field. Yeah, so that's the same as what we saw in the game, in the arcade game. Uh, so screen mode is full screen window. Redefine keys. I think I've already done all that. Oh, credits. Might as well bring that up. So Sokura, Soren Borquist, music by Infamous UK. 
original game and idea ACG. So this particular version is all done by uh, Borgquist. Graphics, sound effects, and programming. Good stuff. Uh, let me see. So let's have a go. Level one. Um, the the page, the web page for where this this sort of remake is hosted, um, claims that Big Ted is a panda, which he does look a bit like in this version. So that's. I guess maybe a misinterpretation of the character sprite. Um, but by the time of the Spectrum release, uh, Borquist has um, updated and fixed that to now say that he is indeed a koala. <laughs> okay, so we got sound effects for the dingoes as well. Oh, nasty. Oh gosh. That's quite violent, actually. Um, yeah, so as you can see, it's, it's a very faithful remake. Um, just with updated graphics and stuff. I don't think any of the mechanics have changed. There's a little sound when the dingoes are sort of hopping around. I wonder if that signifies something. But there's new sound effects and stuff too. I do like that track in the background by Infamous UK. It sounds nice. Sort of that um, techno electro style. Yikes. Who knew a fruit could be so damaging? Uh, so Gibbon goes on about Heionkyo Alien. It is given def deference by and referenced in Genpei Tomoden with the titular aliens serving as enemies therein. And ironically, the Genpei Tomoden skin for Pac-Man 99 features those aliens as the ghost stand-ins when the ghosts were a knockoff of those aliens in the first place, bringing it all full circle. So, if I am interpreting what you're saying, is Hey Ankyo Alien actually a game by Namco? That they, um, that they then sort of iterated on when they made Pac-Man? Or are they just referencing something that, that was out popular at the time? Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Full circle there. <laughs> um, yeah, cool stuff. Yeah. It's a bit of a cat noise when I get attacked, apparently. And the dingoes here are very dark in color, although they at least look more like dogs than they did in on the arcade version. Um, yeah, like I said, Dingo's very kind of dark orange in colour. You know, much like the sands of the the deserts of Australia. I think our main deserts are the Great Simpson Desert and the Great Victorian Desert or something. But, you know, they're colonizer names. I don't know what they're really called. Yeah. Okay, um, so as you can see, the remakes are very faithful. I also want to check out the, the, the follow-up. So that was 2008, the PC remake there. Um, I should open up the Fuse emulator now to show you the Spectrum remake, or demake, I, I could say. Oops, sorry. Game image. Uh, this one. All right. Uh, let me just reboot that. Reset. So this is a pretty good Spectrum emulator. I I should have used it more often. It's pretty easy to use. It's called Fuse. But yeah, in 2011, um, Soren Borgquist and Mark Jones collaborated to. Uh, re-remake Dingo, this time for the ZX Spectrum. So it's playable in Spectrum emulators. Um, probably if you <laughs> took it to the real thing, it might work. But I think people might have misinterpreted, yeah, Sokura. I've seen it written as Sokuran with an N at the end, but that might be just misinterpreted in this font. It's I've seen it now twice with H at the end, so that's 
the name that um, Borquist is going under for this. Uh, yeah, I noticed the banana was swapped to first prize um, in the previous remake, but it's back more like the arcade one here, I think. Anyway, um, yeah, Big Ted is back. And by the way, if you're Australian, you will be familiar with uh, Big Ted, thanks to um, Play School. Sorry, I just realized that I should set up. Well, I had a set up, didn't I? Oh, no, that's right. I changed the, the key bindings in the emulator so that it would work. Oh, look at that. Look at those names. Yep. Okay. A lot of names that are integral to <laughs> Dingo there. Um, let me see. Refund. Just okay. oh, I actually want to go back to that screen real quick and just have another look at it. But as Given says in chat, Namco was in talks to do ports or distribution or something of Hey Ankyo Alien, which was put out on PC before hitting arcades, but it ended up being published by Deki Onkyo and Sega. But yes, Namco was very aware and interested in it. So what you're saying is like unlicensed use of the aliens in um, Genpei Tomodan and Pac-Man 99. Interesting. Strange. <laughs> okay. But Gibbon also reacting. Oh, yes, those good old ZX sound effects. Yeah, this is a very ZX Spectrum style game. And as they've shown by making this port, it really does feel at home on the Spectrum. Um going from how it looked and, and felt on the arcade. Although, again, uh, the actual, you know, gameplay is very arcade-y, action-y. Um, but there you go. That's what I've said already. Mark Jones doing things. Okay, Mark Jones, Stampers, Phil Cobbley, Aid Smithhurst, Gary Bracey, Retro Gamer Mag, Simon Butler, Joe Fish, Anna Blackson, John Caldwell, David East. Oh, pause it if you want to read those names. Anyway, uh, let's uh, play the game. How do I do that? Start game. Did that work? Uh, oh, uh, yes. Okay, yeah, we actually have an introductory like plot here. B yumby. I don't know what that means, but there you go. Um, showing kind of the the premise of the game. The dingoes are here. They're gonna take your fruit, so you can attack them. And I really like how this plays. I think they've done a great job here. Um, if you press... Oh, gosh. That was quick. Uh, the dingoes look a lot like they did in the arcade, of course. Um, I think this is um, a very... Maybe even more faithful than the 2008 remake in terms of its look. Um, but they've actually simplified the game screen. It's a bit smaller, of course, which makes sense given the different aspect ratio and the, the hardware they're working with. But yeah, it looks really amazing. Um, the sprites are only one color, of course. But all the mechanics are here, as before. Um, yeah, the dingoes will smash fruit and throw it at you. And you have that one projectile thing, which is actually represented in the UI this time, which is nice. Uh, you, As long as you have one fruit uh, ready to throw, it'll be up there in the corner of the screen. Um, oh, rude. The dingo hit me before I could hit it. My name is Eight. Yep, I'm Eight. Good to meet you. Uh, so five and then, yep, yeah, okay. I'll have another go. Um, let me see. Was there anything else I wanted to say about this? No, I don't think so. Just that Big Ted is on is a teddy bear on Play School, a very popular children's program here. Actually, I think Play School originates in the UK, but we have a version of it. Anyway, um, yeah, what I was saying about the controls, if you are sort of between grasses and then you press like sideways, Ted will actually like pop up and then start moving along that lane. So it's actually really friendly. Um, you don't have to be precisely lined up with an opening as you did in uh, the pit or grass bin, um, where it was a little bit tricky. Uh, Blueprint, with its auto running, was a little bit easier to navigate because you could hold the direction you wanted to go as you were approaching a thing. Um, but yeah, you don't have to be lined up with a lane to run down it if you press down. See, Ted sort of 
adjusts um, his own positioning to get down that uh, that lane, which is really nice. Um, dang, those dingoes are too quick. I love their little laughing animation when they hit you. That's a lot of that's that's nice little attention to detail and just character for the game, you know. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, we're, we're about at knocking off time. Um, I'll have another run or two of this because it's a lovely little port here. Uh, a latter day port to the Spectrum. Um, if they tried to do it at the time, I don't think they, the end product would have been as good as this is. Homebrew coders, I guess, have more time and expertise and that kind of thing. So often these kinds of homebrew projects end up better than what you had at the time. For example, like you get things like the Atari 2600 port of Donkey Kong, which only had the two levels, but um, modern homebrew, you know, bedroom coders for Atari games uh, have reworked that port and added the missing levels, things like that, um, or made more faithful versions. I know that the Intellivision Donkey Kong is also maligned, and then someone took it upon themselves to make a proper Intellivision Donkey Kong and, and even added a lot of stuff to it. Um, and then made a sequel to that. All pretty fascinating. I really should cover that in more detail one time. Barely scratched the surface of that whole thing on our um, Arcade Era Power Hour podcast when we had Bob on talking about the Donkey Kong whoops, uh, mods and hacks and stuff. That was a good episode. Um, anyway. Uh, yes, okay. Let's run this run out. Whoops. Yep, so they spawn in with a little effect to show you that they're coming, but I missed that and I died. So that's our game over, that's fine. Let's finish it there. Um, we've knocked a few of the names off, but I don't know who most of them are, but definitely... Oh, well, that's it. <laughs> anyway, oh, that was fun. Hope you enjoyed that one. Um, yeah, like, this is a great follow-up stream to when I looked at the post-Rare mobile games, what people from Rare have done since leaving. This is the other end of the spectrum, <laughs> sorry, pardon the pun, um, what the foundational Rare members did before even Ultimate Play the Game was um, a name that existed in uh, the, game the gaming scene. Um, so yeah, I hope you have a better appreciation of what the Stampers and La John Lathbury um, had under their belts going into the Spectrum era of Ultimate and um, the kinds of things that rare people were doing even before any of the games you'd ever heard of. Um, I certainly had a lot of fun researching this and I found the games that I played today were a lot of fun. Um, yeah, Big Ted and J JJ were pretty cool. I'm, I'm thinking about like the characters that we've met today through these games, which you certainly get a lot more of in these sort of cartoony maze action games more than you do in space shooters where you're just like a spaceship. But it was also a revelation to find the pit uh, being a predecessor to, you know, Boulder Dash and Dig Dug, which is so huge. But um, yeah, that'll do it for today. This was a lot of fun again. Uh, next time I might do ports, I might do some other stuff. There's a few more streams that I have planned for uh, for rare games that you rarely see. Um, there's there's always more to be found, apparently, because <laughs> I I didn't I thought this would be like a month and a bit, but it's it's ended up going for a very long time. This stream series, which is fine, I, I'm enjoying it a lot, and I hope you are too. But I'll see you next time. And until then, uh, stay cool, stay frosty. Stay safe and get vaccinated if you can. Yeah. Okay, bye.